Hey, I'm Matt Perkinson with the South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. Uh, I am the Saltwater Fishing Outreach Coordinator for the Marine Division, and today I have with me Olivia Bueno, who is our Volunteer Coordinator. Hello, Olivia. Hello. So the reason we wanted to do this webinar today is that, as, as some of you may have heard, our southern flounder population has been in decline for, for a number of years, and especially over the last decade or so, both in South Carolina and really over the whole region. And so over the last year, we've been going out, we've been speaking with uh, anglers throughout the state and really trying to educate folks on the extent of this issue, but also collect as much input as we can on what people would like to see us do going forward as we try to manage this fishery. Today, what we really want to do is sort of walk you through the management process. And then we also want to answer some of these frequently asked questions about southern flounder um, that we run into when we talk to folks uh, in our travels. So uh, I'm going to have Olivia ask me some questions and I'm going to try to answer those questions for you. Thanks, Matt. Before we get too deep into the topic, can you give us a little background on southern flounder biology in South Carolina waters? Yeah, so in South Carolina, we really have three major flounder species. Um, we have our summer and gulf flounders that are, for the most part, found out in the open ocean in deeper waters. And then we have our southern flounder, and, and that's the flounder that you're most likely to encounter in our estuaries. So, in fact, if you catch a flounder in, in an estuary in shore waters in South Carolina, um, the odds are that it's going to be a southern flounder. You can see on the picture here, the southern flounder is the one with that mottled color, a lot of white spots on it. And our southern flounder tend to be in our inshore waters really from about April through October and November, depending on water conditions. Uh, as the water temperature starts to drop, those adult flounder will move off into offshore waters where they form spawning aggregations and spawn. Um, after that spawn, the larvae are gonna move into back into our estuaries They'll settle out into our smaller creeks, they grow into juveniles, and then eventually uh, become adults and, and form part of that, that spawning aggregation for the next generation. Southern flounder, uh, the females tend to be a lot larger than the males. So if you catch a fish that's legal size or really anywhere close to legal size, um, the odds are that that's gonna be a female fish. We see that there are fairly short-lived species. The max age in South Carolina is about six years old. And a female uh, at minimum size of 15 inches is about two years old. And that's also about the age and the size that they reach uh, reproductive capability and are capable of going out and spawning. There was a regional stock assessment for Southern Flounder a few years back. Can you tell us a little bit about what goes into that process and what we learned from it? Yeah, so stock assessment's really just an opportunity uh, for data scientists, fisheries managers to gather all the available data on a, a specific fish species. Um, and that data can include any, any of the information from our monitoring programs, our catch data, genetics data, tagging data. All that information is typically fed into a model. And what that model is going to tell us is what that fishery looked like in the past, uh, what it looks like currently, and then predict what it's going to look like going into the future. So specifically with this Southern Flounder Stock Assessment, uh, this was a regional assessment, so it included the states of North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida. And that's because those four states make up the stock of Southern Flounder in the Southeast, uh, in the Southeast Atlantic here. Um, the results of that assessment, essentially in a nutshell, said that our population's in, in very poor shape, it's at an all-time low, and we're gonna need to reduce the amount of fish that are harvested if we want to see that fishery really recover over the next decade. So I just kind of want to walk you through this particular uh, image that I have on the screen here. This is the amount of adult fish on the left side of, of this graph here. And along the bottom, you've got time. And so this black line is going to show you the amount of adult fish that, that we see in, in the entire region over time. You've got an orange line at the top here that would be the level that we would consider a um, fully rebuilt or a healthy flounder population of adults. This red line here is showing you your threshold population. Um, that's basically a line that if you drop below that, um, 
it's a sign that there's a problem with your fishery and you need to take some sort of action um, to rebuild that fishery. You can see from the graph here, over the last 30 years or so, we've been below that threshold population the entire time. And over the last 10 years, we've really seen that population decrease further. So we're gonna um, need to take some sort of corrective action if we're interested in seeing this fishery fully recover over the next decade. You mentioned that this was a regional stock assessment. How are the flounder in South Carolina connects to the flounder population in North Carolina, Georgia, and Florida? Yeah, so as I mentioned, we're talking about one stock of fish. Um, what we can see from our tagging data is that, you know, flounder within a given season may tend to stick around uh, one area, but over time, those fish tend to move from the north to the south. So there's there's a lot more movement between states than, than people think. We have fish from North Carolina that end up in South Carolina and fish from South Carolina that end up down in Georgia and Florida. Um, what the genetics tells us is that flounder in, in all of these states are, are not significantly different from each other. And, and that means that there must be some sort of mixing going on. Um, that could be our adults when they're going out into the spawning population. They're maybe mixing there when they're spawning. Or it could mean that the larvae that they're producing are, are distributing out and mixing into these different states. Um, but in a nutshell, what that really means is that we have one stock of flounder um, throughout the region. And what we do in South Carolina is going to affect what happens in other states. People may have heard that North Carolina made some pretty big changes to their flounder regulations last year. Can you talk about how they came about and how North Carolina and South Carolina are different when it comes to management? Yeah, so North Carolina has a fishery management plan for flounder. And, and that says that if a stock assessment comes out and, and says that southern flounder are considered to be overfished, then by law, they have to take actions that will rebuild that fishery over the course of 10 years. Um, in South Carolina, it operates a little differently in that uh, the Department of Natural Resources conducts all the research uh, on fisheries. We monitor populations, we monitor catch, um, but we ultimately take all that data to provide recommendations to the legislature. But it's ultimately really up to the South Carolina legislature to make our fisheries laws. So if, if we want to see a change in regulations in South Carolina, the South Carolina uh, House of Representatives and Senate need to pass a bill that will, will codify those changes into law. What does our fishery look like in South Carolina? How much of it is commercial and how much is recreational? Yeah, so just a, a reminder of, of what our current size limits are. We have a 15 inch uh, size limit, minimum size limit. Uh, we have a bag limit of 10 fish per person per day, and then a boat limit of 20 fish per boat per day. Uh, and in South Carolina, our Southern flounder fishery is really dominated by the recreational side. Um, over 99% of our catch comes from the recreational side versus the commercial side. Um, we have uh, in the past had a bigger commercial fishery. Um, right now, over the last 10 years, we've seen a little less than 2,000 pounds a year of harvest on the commercial side and compare that to you know, closer to 400,000 pounds of harvest on, on the recreational side. So our recreational side is really made up of, of two main components. It's our hook and line and then our gig fishery. And how do we collect our data on harvest? So our commercial landings are, are directly reported and we get that data pretty close to, to real time. Our recreational landings are um, estimated as part of our marine recreational information program. And so if you've been at the boat ramp and you've had folks uh, asked to measure your fish, um, those are our creel clerks. They, they work um, to provide data to this, this MREP program. Um, that and then a mail survey are, are meshed together to come up with an estimate of the amount of, of fish that have been harvested over a given time period. Let's talk about our flounder population here in South Carolina. How do our biologists monitor the southern flounder population? Yeah, so we're really lucky here in South Carolina that we have two very excellent long-term data sets for, for managing our, our fish species. Uh, the first is our electrofishing survey, uh, and that operates up in our higher parts of our estuaries, lower salinity brackish waters. Um, the boat sends an electric current into the water that stuns the fish. They're then netted, um, the fish are measured, uh, genetic samples can be taken, uh, tags when appropriate, and then they're released back into the water. Uh, in the lower parts of our estuaries, in our higher salinity areas, 
uh, is where our trammel net survey operates. Uh, you've probably seen these boats around. They encircle a, a section of shoreline and they move along that shoreline and spook the fish out into that net. Um, the fish are able to make it through one panel of the net and are trapped in the middle. They bring those fish in, again, measure them, take genetic samples, uh, and release them back in the wild. And both of these surveys, uh, the, the really big advantage of these is that they've been operating so long, they cover a, a big section of our coast, and uh, what we can, can do is look at long-term trends in fish populations. So we can look at the number of fish that were caught um, per section for the electro fishing survey or per net set for the trammel net survey uh, and, and look at trends. We can look in the trammel net survey to how many southern flounder were caught in the trammel net in 1989, 1999, 2009, and 2019. And that gives us a really good sense of, of any trends that are happening in that fishery. And how did the results of our survey compare to what we saw in their regional assessment? So our, our local data really agrees pretty, pretty closely with what we saw in that regional survey. Um, you can look on the graph here. The blue line is our trammel net survey, and this is fish per net set there. Um, and then our electro fishing survey is an orange. And what we see is, is just a general decline in the amount of fish that have been caught per net set or per section of shoreline. We know that our flounder populations are decreasing. How do we come up with a plan for that fishery to fully recover? What tools do we have available to reduce the harvest? So we have a lot of options available to us. Um, two of the more commonly used are bag limit restrictions and changing the size limit. Um, we also can institute a season like you see in our deer management um, or an area restriction like you see with our uh, cobia fishery down in the southern part of our state. Uh, we have a spawning season closure during the month of May. Um, also gear restrictions. Uh, but the most common thing is, is some combination of those that will help us get to the amount of reduction we need to see the fishery recover. We also wanted to incorporate public input into our recovery plan. Can you tell us a little bit about the online flounder survey? Yeah, we, we instituted a, an online survey in December of last year, and we had about 2,000 people respond to that. Uh, what we were really trying to find out was um, what people thought about the southern flounder fishery in its current state. We also wanted to see what sort of interest they had in, in seeing that fishery recover. Um, we provided some of these, these specific management options or tools that we just talked about um, and, and gave them the opportunity to, to give us feedback on what they would like to see us do going forward. Um, so it's just some of the basic uh, results of that survey. The first is that people did recognize that the flounder population was in trouble. Um, they told us that they are seeing less flounder, they're seeing smaller flounder, um, and that they thought the fishery was in pretty poor shape. Um, they also, the vast majority, about 95%, said that they were interested in seeing this fishery be rebuilt, and not just rebuilt, but rebuilt over the short term. And when we laid out some of those management options for, for people, there were some that were more popular than others. The bag limit restriction was the most popular, um, but the majority supported all of those options. And, and really any combination of options that would allow us to, to see this fishery recover over the next decade. And what is DNR's recommendation? So the agency's official position is that uh, action needs to be taken so that this flounder fishery can recover over the next 10 years. And with that goal in mind, how do we get there? So we looked at over 100 different combinations of size limit, bag limit, um, seasonality, to try to first come up with an option that would achieve that full recovery. Um, but also we wanted to balance that with, with selecting a suite of options that we're gonna give our anglers the most access to that fish, fishery during the recovery period. And so the specific options that, that we're looking at are uh, reducing the bag limit from 10 fish per person a day down to two fish, uh, reducing the boat limit from 20 fish down to six fish, uh, maintaining that 15 inch minimum size limit, and then implementing a fishing season that runs from July 1st until October 31st of each year. And so uh, some of the advantages of, of that specific combination of options is First, uh, it should achieve that full recovery of the fishery within that 10-year period with some nice incremental gains in between. 
Um, again, it will allow our anglers to, to have access to the fishery during that time. Um, it will maximize the yield in the fishery, which means that that 15 inch size limit is the size that we've settled on is the most efficient for the fishery to operate. If you were to increase that anymore, you're gonna see that, that some of these 15 and 16 inch fish that are released are not gonna survive. So we've really settled in on 15 inches as the most efficient size limit. Uh, it will also keep that fishery open during much of the summer and the fall. And, and again, this is going to, with these bag limit and boat limit restrictions, um, it's going to uh, address the gig fishery and the hook and line fishery and reduce some of that harvest, but it's not gonna absolutely eliminate that practice. What can we expect to see as the population begins to rebuild and what does that mean for the sustainability of the species? So a lot of people in South Carolina have probably never had an opportunity to really fish on a quality Southern flounder fishery. And, and while we do expect that it's gonna take some time for this fishery to be fully rebuilt, um, we, we do expect some incremental increases in, in the population um, that should happen fairly soon, assuming we, we take corrective measures right now. Um, that means that we're gonna have more fish in the fishery and we're gonna have some larger fish in the fishery. And, and all of that results in, in a more quality fishery for everybody in South Carolina. As far as sustainability, uh, the more adults that you have in that population, the larger your, your spawning biomass of adults, um, that means you're gonna have more larvae uh, being brought into the estuary. Uh, it's, you're gonna have a better chance of replenishing that population into the next generation. And it also means with that more larval supply, you've got a bit of a buffer if there's any increase in fishing or environmental conditions that um, would have a negative impact on the fishery. So having more adults, having more fish spawning and having more larval supply is, is always a good thing in a fishery. Since the legislative process can take some time, what can concerned anglers do in the meantime to help their recovery? Yeah, we, we always recommend that the folks use the best practices uh, that they possibly can to handle fish. And so um, if you know you're going to release a fish, um, use a net, preferably a, a rubber coated net. Um, get that fish in and, and back into the water pretty quickly. Um, in the case of a gut hook fish, we, we do recommend that people clip that hook as close to the hook eye as possible. And, and then again, you know, people can make their own limits. Um, we, we encourage people to only keep the, the fish that they know that they're gonna eat and practice moderation so that we know that we're gonna have a sustainable fishery into the future. Now that we've gone through the management process, we have a handful of questions we receive regularly about flounder. Let's run through some of those. Why are some anglers still successful at catching flounder? Yeah, so you know, again, when, when we've traveled around, the, the vast majority of people that we've talked to have said they've seen less flounder, um, they're having less success. But you do still hear from folks that, that I had a good night fishing or I had a good season. I mean, there's a reason that that can occur. Um, the reason is that when your population is really large, like you see in the picture here, you're gonna have flounder spread out throughout the estuary. Um, they're gonna be on your absolute best habitats, areas like this with, with shell and, and transitions between shell and mud and, and lots of available bait fish, but they're also gonna spill over into maybe some of your more mediocre areas, um, just based on space availability. As that population starts to decline, the first thing you're gonna see is, is that fish are gonna disappear from some of those more mediocre habitats. Um, that's because as they're pulled off, there are no fish that are, that are coming in to replace those fish. Um, also, fish on these, these absolute best habitats here, as fish are pulled off, there's more space available for, for other fish to move into that area. What that really means is that these absolute best habitats can hold fish all the way up into a point where the population is close to crashing. Um, and that means that um, even when the fishery is in a decline, um, somebody who is skilled at, at going out and finding those best habitats can still have some success. It's just not necessarily a sign that the overall fishery is in good shape. And how much of an impact does the gig fishery have on the flounder population? That's always a really difficult question for us to answer, uh, primarily because that gig fishery occurs almost exclusively at nighttime. And of course, our creel surveys are operating during the daytime. Um, through some of the, the directed surveys that we've done in the past, 
We do know that, of, of course, there are less gigging trips during the year just based on uh, having the right tide and, and wind conditions and everything else. But those trips are more successful. Uh, anglers in a gig trip do bring home more flounder per trip than, than hook and line anglers. Um, but getting the exact proportion of uh, the gig fishery to the overall recreational fishery is very difficult. Um, with that said, the specific combination of options that we put forth here would have a, an impact on that gig fishery as well as the hook and line fishery, would allow us to reduce the amount of harvest, but then would still allow access uh, to the fishery and, and wouldn't completely eliminate the practice. How about shrimp trawling? Is there a big impact there? Yeah, so over time, uh, as, as our shrimp trawl fishery, uh, the number of boats on the water has decreased. Um, we've seen a whole lot less catch, uh, bycatch of southern flounder. Um, back in the, in the 80s, when they could trawl in inshore waters, um, there was a much larger bycatch fishery. Um, over time, those, those boats are now only trawling out in, in open ocean waters. Um, and we've added things like turtle excluder devices and bycatch reduction devices. Um, and that means that there are less southern flounder that are caught as part of the, the shrimp trawl fishery. Um, the other thing that, that some people don't realize is that we, we have several flatfish species here in South Carolina. And we have the summer and gulf flounder that, that are out in the ocean and, and are you know, caught more often by our shrimp trawls. But we also hear a lot about the um, juvenile or, or baby flounder that are being caught in the shrimp net. And um, we also have a lot of flatfish species in South Carolina, uh, like the hog choker that you can see in the picture here, that really never grow uh, into a much larger size than that. Um, and they're much more likely to be caught in those trawls than, than our southern flounder. So we do know that we have a, uh, there's an impact of the, the shrimp trawls, but it's, it's pretty small compared to our recreational fishery. If all the bigger flounder are females, why don't we just lower the size limit? So that's a good question. And um, at our current minimum size of 15 inches, um, the vast majority of those fish are gonna be females. Um, but if you were to move that size limit down to say 12 inches, you're still catching a big majority of females. Um, but at the same time, you're also not protecting those 13 and 14 inch fish um, before they have a chance to, those females, before they have a chance to join the adult population, um, be able to move offshore and to spawn. And so um, if we move down to a smaller size, we're not getting a real benefit as far as the ratio of males to females, um, but we are losing that protection for our females um, before they get to that 15 inch size limit. Um, on the other side of that, you know, as we sort of talked about, if we were to increase that size limit up to something like 17 inches, then we're, we're incurring a lot more release mortality on those 15 and 16 inch fish. Anything else you'd like to share about the rebuilding process? Yeah, I just you know, wanted to point out that this isn't really um, all doom and gloom here. You know, anybody who knows me knows that, that I love to catch flounder. Um, and, and I'm really genuinely excited that if we can make some changes here, um, they're going to have a really positive impact on our fishery, and, and we have a chance to see a really strong quality fishery here in South Carolina in the future. And so I think that's all the questions that we have today. Um, I just want to encourage folks to go to our website. It's dnr.sc.gov. If you scroll to the bottom, uh, you will see all of our social media platforms and also have the opportunity to sign up for our newsletters. And uh, wanted to thank Olivia for, for joining me and uh, we look forward to doing more of these webinars in the future.